afternoon, good morning, good evening, or maybe even good night to some of you. Welcome to you all to, to the second day of the Van Gulik, the KVVAK Van Gulik, Gulik program and the grand finale of the activities at the China Cultural Center. My name is Rosalie van der Poel, your moderator of this afternoon. And I'm also a board member of the KVVAK, the Royal Society of Asian Art in the Netherlands. We are delighted to welcome old and new friends from all over the world here to celebrate the legendary writer, sinologist, and the diplomat Robert van Gulik. Today, we will explore more facets of his many lives, notably his life as an artist, as an art collector, mirroring the Chinese literati taste. But before we embark on our journey, I would like to brief run, briefly run through the program. After a few welcome words, we will look at how and why Van Gulik continues to fascinate. We will do this by looking back at the Young Scholars Symposium that took place yesterday and the current exhibitions at the Rijksmuseum and at the China Cultural Center. We will then immerse into his world by learning more and hearing his beloved Gu Qin being played, the ancient instrument of great refinement favored by the Chinese literati. After a tea break, we will fully dive into his adventurous life by following his tracks around the world with the Dutch filmmaker Rob Rombout. Note that you can chat with us and with the group in the chat box throughout the afternoon and questions will be noted for the Q&A at the end. I see many familiar faces who were there yesterday. This is Coase and Laurent and, well, Anne Gerritse also. Very nice. Pauline Kusuman, very nice to be with us. Um, it's so wonderful that you could make it to be with us today. Um, for now, um, it's an honor for me to introduce Peter Kappers, the chairman of the KVVAK, the Royal Asian Art Society in the Netherlands, for his welcome speech. Peter, the floor for you. Good afternoon, welcome to you all, to our live stream from The Hague, the second day of the Robert van Gulik two-day online program. For those who are not familiar, our society in Dutch, Koninklijke Vereniging van Vrienden der Aziatische Kunst, <coughs> was founded in 1918. Its goal was to stimulate the love for Asian art, to study it and to form a collection of Asian art of high quality, the highest quality, with the help of private sponsors, and to show that to the general public. In 1932, the society opened in Amsterdam the Museum of Asian Art, and in 1952, the collection moved to our partner, the Rijksmuseum, and there it is now at the Asian Pavilion. It is on loan to the museum. It is also shown at other museums in the Netherlands. The society at the moment, the collection, has a, a collection of near 2,000 objects, and this collection is still growing. The society publishes already 50 years a magazine, Asiatische Kunst, with the help of an excellent uh, editorial team, including the curators of Asian art at the Rijksmuseum. And then we have Ikigai, the Society's Young Professionals Network, that was also involved yesterday in the organization of the wonderful symposium. And the Society sponsors, with others, the Chair of Asian Art at the University of Leiden, with Professor Anna Gertz, who will speak to you later. Yesterday, many of you attended the Society's Young Scholars Symposium Rethinking Robert van Gulik, which was a great success with high attendance. Loaded with new information on van Gulik, by also reaching out 
to a new generation with great interest in this unique and versatile personality, 54 years after his untimely passing away in 1967. Today, we are very proud to be partner with the China Cultural Center. In another problem on Robert von Hulek with a very befitting subtitle, Refined Enjoyment of Elegant Leisure. Shedding new light and focusing on the genius of von Hulek. The sheer vastness of his production and the many, many areas of interest of von Hulek are astounding. A diplomat, a collector of Chinese art, a thinker, practicing and exploring the Chinese poetry, calligraphy, painting, music, writing, and illustrating the Judge D mysteries, writing on sexual life in ancient China, it seems endless. His importance cannot be overstated. Today's Verai program, the exhibition tours, lectures, music, and film will celebrate Robert van Gude, but also pave the way for a wider cultural dialogue between China and the Netherlands. I wish you a wonderful afternoon with us and I'll pass on the word to Mr. Huang Hongchan, the director of the Chinese Cultural Center, our host today. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kalpers, for your wonderful speech. A good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Huang Hongchan, the director of China Cultural Center in The Hague. It is my great pleasure to have you with us. First, I'd like to introduce you a bit about China Cultural Center and the event. China Cultural Center in The Hague is an official nonprofit cultural institution set up by the uh, government in the Netherlands in 2016. It is dedicated to display and put forward both cultural and tourism exchanges and cooperations between the two countries. It is located in The Hague, but faces the whole country, the Netherlands. We organize performances, exhibitions, workshops and seminars, training courses of Chinese language and tea, Chinese paintings and calligraphy, etc., either at CCC or elsewhere in the Netherlands or online sometimes, just like this time. Through the China Cultural Center, we're hoping to open a window of China and to widen the bridge between two countries and people. For this exhibition, Robert Van Gulik and Chinese Culture, we opened it here last December, but we cannot receive visitors because of pandemic. But during the lockdown, we have been organizing a series of online events aimed at telling stories about Van Gogh to a wider range of people worldwide, exploring and rethinking more about Robert Van Gogh in the new era. I'm not going to tell more about him as my colleagues will do today. This is a special event in cooperation with KBVRK uh, please allow me to say thanks to friends who have contributed for us. They are Miss Rosaline uh, van, der Fel, van der Poel, yeah, I'm sorry, for Leiden University, the board member of KVRK, our coordinator. Our guest curator, Miss Marianne Solomia, the granddaughter of Robert van Gulik, and Pauline, the daughter of Robert van Gulik and as well as the Van Gogh family. Mr. Ching Ling Huang, curator of the Rights Museum. Mr. Rob Robant, who is now with us today. And last but not least, the great Chinese art collector, Mr. Fei Yu Liang, who has contributed his great collections from Robert Van Gogh here at the backstage. So uh, Mr. Phil Yang is with us online. Uh, please allow me to invite him to make a speech. Okay, Mr. Phil Yang. 尊敬的Beat, 
卡比斯主席先生，尊敬的黄主任、主持人胡小梅女士，大家好，我是费玉良，很高兴接受邀请，我可以在家里参加这个线上活动，我觉得很有趣。我在荷兰教习武术、太极拳和健身气功已有三十五年了，年轻时。我就受家父影响，开始收藏中国古董和艺术品。我也是亚洲艺术协会的会员。感谢海牙、中国文化中心的邀请，使我有机会在中心举办的高楼佩与中国文化主题展览中，展示高楼佩先生的珍贵中国珠画作品。这部分作品是上世纪八十年代。我在阿姆斯特丹加士德的一次拍卖会上进拍得来的。那时候我刚到荷兰不久，高罗佩并了解并不多。但是与此时，当我看到我熟悉的几位中国书画大家的作品时，我意识到高罗佩不是一般人。于是我决定收藏它，并在随后这些年开始研究高罗佩。我更多的了解到，作为一个河南著名的外交官、汉学家、收藏家和中国艺术鉴赏家，对中国文化的热情和痴迷，他把优秀的中国文化介绍到河南和欧洲，做出了卓越的贡献。我对他表示由衷的敬佩。我是一位中国文化的。实践者，希望将来有更多的机会与大家切磋武艺，交流有关中国古董收藏与鉴藏等方面的经验和知识，互相学习，在文化交流活动中找到更多的乐趣。谢谢大家。Thank you, Master Fei. We are grateful to be surrounded by some of your beautiful pieces here at the exhibition in The Hague. Now let's move to understanding why and how Van Gulik continues to fascinate us. We will do this with Anne Gerritsen. She holds the chair of Asian art at the, at the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. And, she has, um, and she's also a professor at the History Department of Warwick University. Please, Anna, take the floor. Thank you very much, um, and apologies for the brief hiccup there. Um, I'm delighted to have this chance to speak to you about yesterday's Young Scholars Symposium, Rethinking Robert von Gulik, New Perspectives and Approaches. Of course, uh, in the 10 minutes that I have been given here, I can't do justice to all of the, the <laughs> papers, um, but I will do my best to give you at least a little bit of a flavor. It was certainly, as you already heard, a very well attended event. <coughs> There's a brief overview of some of the participants yesterday, and this is only a fraction of them. There were about 180 people there, which is a wonderful number of, of people present. If you're interested in the full details of yesterday's event, I recommend that you go to the KVVAK website and download the full program, which is available for you there. Um, it has uh, the biographies of the individual speakers and the abstracts. So I think um, if you're interested in more detail, then please um, look there. Uh, this can only really give you just a brief flavor of the wonderful things we learned yesterday. So what did we learn? That's the question. What did we learn about Robert van Gulik? Well, many things, of course, we already know, and more than anything, um, the events yesterday confirmed this um, beautiful piece of calligraphy from Coast Kuiper's presentation, having many arts and talents. This piece of calligraphy by Chibai Shur from his collection sums up the man um, 
almost as fully as anyone could ever do it. Um, many arts and many talents. But I think we learned more than that. We learned, for example, from almost every one of the eight papers we heard yesterday, how important the network of friendship and the network of connections that Van Gulik built around himself were for understanding who he was. Without seeing this network, we don't really see the man. He never operated as an individual. He had an extensive network of friends in each of these many circles which you have already heard about. Um, beyond that, he had an even wider circle of acquaintances, colleagues and correspondents. And all of those, I think, made Van Gulik the man he was. And when we look at his collection, his letters, at his writings, we see traces of those friendships absolutely everywhere. We see it in the exchange of gifts, for example. We see it in the seals that were carved for him and that he carved for others. We see it in the calligraphies that he exchanged and received from friends. And most notable, perhaps, this example here, well, it's one of many, many examples I could have chosen, but it's striking because the uh, calligrapher here who gifted this to Robert van Gulik is Guomor Ro, one of the foremost poets and intellectuals of the 20th century. So he wasn't just a man with many connections and many circles and friendships. He was a man with very powerful and very significant friendships. And that makes him, too, a very significant figure within the 20th century. I think one of the things we learned yesterday is that in this extensive network of people that he gathered amongst around himself, he didn't make distinctions. In fact, he created similarities between friends and colleagues. He combined work and pleasure. Diplomacy and academia inextricably became connected in his being. And we saw that particularly in one of the papers by Karin Chong, who looked at um, his Korean connections and found in the archives in The Hague uh, a report of a trip to Korea. And it showed precisely how he went as a private individual on a knowledge gathering um, for his own private interests. But really what he was doing was intelligence gathering at the same time. I don't think those things were distinct in his mind. It's in fact precisely the combination and the bringing together of all of these fields that made Van Gulik the man he was. And I think that certainly became very clear in all of the papers we heard yesterday. We might think that we can get to know the man through his possessions. And certainly many of the papers drew on his possessions, the things that he had had or had still or are still part of the Van Gulik family today. Um, but at the same time, all of the papers made very profoundly clear to all of us what we cannot know about the man, because so many of his objects were scattered in one way or another by people creating collections in different parts of the world, by the giving and receiving of gifts, and by sales. Many of the objects have come up for sale and have been lost for the knowledge um, once they've entered into private possession. Many objects were, of course, sadly destroyed. Some of the objects in the possession um, of the family and in the collections are not well documented or in fact wrongly dated. And some objects have question marks and may well be forgeries. So in fact, when we look at these in more detail, as we did in the papers yesterday, when we look at the a poster of the sale or at unidentified friends in the seals or at a document that we cannot actually place within a Chinese context that may well be his creation or the objects that are destroyed, we realize how difficult it is to get to know the man through his objects. And this was a very apt quote that Coase Kuiper brought to our attention here from a very famous 12th century, sorry, 11th century poet, uh, Su Shi, who wrote, a gentleman can pay attention or appreciate material objects, but he should not become entangled in them. We saw it both as an apt quote to bring to the attention of Robert von Gulik himself, who had to come to terms with the loss of objects through war destruction. Um, but it's also an apt reminder for us today. We should be enjoying objects, we should appreciate them, but we should not be too entangled in them. 
we got to know Van Gulik as a musician. We knew him in this guise already, of course. We knew his famous book, The Lore of the Chinese Lute. But um, one of the speakers, Marc Gilbert, who has recently received um, one of the possessions, um, a box, a musical box with objects, and it's been gifted to the Leiden University Library, and he opened it for us to reveal a different kind of musician, the musician who collects many different scores and annotates them, the musician who goes to the shop and buys strings, a much more private, much more intimate view of this particular musician. And we learned about his musicianship in an entirely different way by in one of the papers that contrasted the chin for which, of course, von Gulik is so famous and of which we will hear more later, but by contrasting it by looking at the drum, um, the other in the musical world, the chin, the refined literati scholarly object, the drum associated with a different social class and almost the kind of antithesis of this refinement. And through that, we get to know that in fact, in that contrast, we see the effort that von Gulik made to be the literati scholar, to be the musician of the chin by debasing its rival. Not that he did that, but she showed us clearly that contrast in her paper. Another important message for today came from the paper by Paramita Pal, who looked at the representations of Buddhism in the illustrations in the Judge D novels and paired that with this powerful quote from von Gulik, where he said, as the Chinese have been so often represented and too often misrepresented in our popular crime literature, it seems only just that they themselves be allowed to have their own say for once in this field. And I think it's a very powerful message, both for the context in which he wrote his novels, where that representation or misrepresentation of the Chinese in popular drama at the time um, was very marked. But even in today's world with anti-Asian racism, that's a, re re a message that retains its relevance very much for us. And I thought that was a very powerful insight in that paper. Then we saw a wonderful paper, paper that showed us the very contemporary reimaginations of the Judge D figure um, and the ways in which in those reimaginations things change. The, the Dutch or the European desire for not knowing the ending of the novel until you get to the end of the detective, the denouement, is contrasted with the Chinese desire to have all the facts on the table right at the outset. And I think what that showed is how this back and forth always brings with it in that process of translation, a process of adaptation that goes from the Judge D from the Tang stories to the imagination of uh, Robert von Gulik and their reimagination in contemporary genres. And it's precisely this back and forth, this constant reimagining that keeps um, von Gulik and his writings alive. So I think what we learned is that von Gulik is many different things combined. I want to bring to your attention this um, journal, Asiati Sekunst. It was already mentioned, it has an entire issue devoted to um, the, the study of Van Gulik. So please do have a look there and at this program. Um, and thank you very much for listening. It was a great event yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It was a fascinating symposium, that's true. And um, we also, it became clear that there is a lot more to, to explore there. Now, because of many of us have not been able to see them, we would like to offer you to discover the current exhibitions at the Rijksmuseum and at the China Cultural Center uh, through two separate video tours. So now we go over to you, Ching Lang, Ching Ling at the Rijksmuseum. My name is Xing Ling Wang, curator of Chinese art. Uh, today I'm going to introduce uh, the new display of uh, the Chinese painting collection from Robert van Gulik. I think 
you all know Robert van Gulik better than I do. He is a Dutch uh, diplomat, sinologist, writer, musician, artist, and also an art collector. So in this display, we displayed um, 12 paintings from his own collection, uh, ranging from 17 to 20 centuries, including calligraphy, landscape painting, figure and portrait painting, flower and birth painting. So let me show you uh, the highlight of this display. This is a portrait painting. Uh, the sitter is Robert van Gulik's uh, music instructor. Robert van Gulik paints this uh, portrait painting after <coughs> uh, his uh, Gu Qing master passed away and as a commemorate uh, portrait. And what's very special is, is uh, around the portrait, it is, uh, there are in total uh, 18 um, color forms, including uh, Robert van Gulik uh, himself. All of them are uh, also uh, musicians uh, who also play the, the instrument of Gu Qing. The number 18 refers to an uh, old Chinese tradition, the gathering of 18 scholars from Tang Dynasty. So here, Robert van Gulik uh, include himself as one of the 18 Gu Qing players uh, to uh, commemorate uh, his teacher. And what very interesting is, <coughs> although, uh, the portrait itself was not painted by Robert van Gulik, but by the professional portrait painter. Uh, Robert van Gulik here painted the rest part of the painting. And here we can also see his signature. And the fact that Robert van Gulik uh, paint uh, also reflecting to his, uh, novel, crea uh, his novel creation. Uh, he is also uh, a famous the novel writer, the series of Chinese uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Rechter T, uh, is very famous. And the, all these illustrations in the Rechter T series was also painted by Robert van Gulik himself. So here we see another talent from this magnificent person. The other painting I would like to introduce is a landscape painted by a very famous uh, painter in the early 20th century, Liu Haisu. And what struck me uh, the most is that in this painting, uh, especially uh, according to he himself uh, wrote on the color phone at the top, uh, he, because he admired the Ming Dynasty Chinese painters and European painter Van Gogh's painting so much so that in this painting he tried to combine the style of the two painters together. And however, what um, a little disappointment was uh, in his color form, he said Van Gogh is a French painter, but Van Gogh is Dutch. This display is made possible uh, by the loan from the Volkerkunde Museum in Leiden. We thank the colleagues there for their support and help. Thank you, Ching Ling. And now let's have a closer look at the exhibition here at the China Cultural Center. Welcome to the China Cultural Center in Den Haag for a viewing of the exhibition 
Robert Van Gulik and Chinese culture, refined enjoyment of elegant leisure. I am Marianne and I'm the curator of this exhibition. I'm also a granddaughter and a fan of Robert Van Gulik. The exhibition, Refined Enjoyment of Elegant Leisure, refers to the elegant pastimes of the Chinese literati and also uh, bring to the fore Robert Van Gulik's work as a source of knowledge, inspiration and creativity today. Now join us for the tour. Here we are at chapter one, Van Gulik as an artist. We see here um, the illustrations which he made for his Judge D books. On the wall on the right and left side, you can see the original prints he used for his Judge D stories and the sources from Leiden University from his own book collection. These collections of ancient Chinese books were used as inspiration to make his own drawings. So we can see here an example of this, the transparent paper he used, and you'll see that he uses his own hybrid style, a mixture between East and West. Here we see an example of Van Gulik as a calligrapher. Robert Van Gulik practiced calligraphy every day of his life. And here you can see some examples of it, where he practices it actually on the business cards of the Dutch embassy. A highlight of the exhibition is the calligraphy of Van Gulik, which is here, you can see it on view. And it's from the personal collection of the family. Van Gulik liked to name his libraries. At each diplomatic post, he would add uh, his calligraphies to the libraries. And this one is particularly beautiful and um, the name of it is the pavilion for watching the transitoriness of life. We can see underneath another very special object which is on loan from Pauline van Gulik, the daughter of Robert van Gulik. They found this object together whilst they were walking on the Malaysian beach. Van Gulik noted it um, not only because it was so beautiful but also because it had room to put his Chinese brushes. So it's very funny and interesting to see that Van Gulik saw the beauty in everyday things, but also saw a function for it, for practicing his Chinese arts. Here we are in front of a very beautiful object, which is um, a porcelain ink pad container. This was used for Van Gulik's seal carving activities and it remained on his desk along with all his other utensils for Chinese art. Now let's move on to chapter two, Van Gulik as a collector. Here we are at chapter two of the exhibition, Robert Van Gulik as a collector. Van Gulik was an avid collector of Chinese art and he collected throughout his life and his postings throughout his travels. His collection of more than 500 paintings was the dearest to him. Van Gulik was a different type of collector. First of all, he was a practitioner himself, a deep, with deeper knowledge of Chinese art and painting. Second of all, what's interesting to note is that he befriended these great artists. Some of the examples are his friendship with Xu Bei Hong or with Fu Bao Shi, which is reflected in his collection. Here we have some very fine examples of paintings which belong to Robert van Gulik. These are in the collection of Master Fei, based in The Hague, who generously lent these paintings for the exhibition. Here we see a calligraphy by Ma Heng, the director of the Forbidden City, the Palace Museum. This was a gift given to van Gulik at his wedding to Shui Shefang in Chunqin. It reads, a happy marriage of a man of learning and a wife from a family of sages. A fine combination of zither and lute, a lucky pair of singing and following. Next, we can see some other examples. And we will also find that on all these paintings, of course, there is Van Gulik's seal, as well as an annotated card system where Van Gulik carefully noted the provenance of these paintings and also how he got them with his personal story. What's very interesting to see is that this collection is now spread around the world. Uh, we can see it currently at the Rijksmuseum, 
And there are some very fine pieces also at the Volkerkunde Museum in Leiden. There is also a permanent exhibition at the Free Gorgeous Museum in Chunchin. Now let's move to chapter three of the exhibition, Van Gulik as a writer, a diplomat and a sinologist. In this section, we invite you to discover the Judge D stories, which made Van Gulik so famous. He wrote 17 stories of Judge D, the historical character of the Tang Dynasty, Di Renjie. These books were translated, are translated in 29 languages, and still inspire readers around the world to immerse themselves in traditional China. We also have a cinema here, a mini cinema, which shows the film of Rob Rumbaut on the track of Robert Van Gulik. In this film, we discover, we see contemporary figures which feel inspired by Robert Van Gulik. Through this figure, we can recompose his persona. These are artists, diplomats, but also fans and musicians. At the same time, we invite you here to reflect and exchange more about the world of Robert Van Gulik and the Chinese literati. Finally, this is also a platform, a platform to exchange and learn more about the Chinese literati and Robert Van Gulik, paving a cultural dialogue between the Netherlands and China. Thank you, Marianne. Now we are ready for our immersion into the world of Robert van Gulik and the Chinese literati by learning more about the ancient musical instrument, the Guqin, and hearing a performance of the Guqin, painting of sounds, as van Gulik called it. We will travel to the Leiden Asian Library to listen to the keynote talk by Willem van Gulik. Willem is the eldest son, son of Robert van Gulik and Professor Emeritus at the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. He is also the former director of the National Museum of Ethnology in Leiden and a former board member of the KTVAK. Willem. The wind rustles in the pines and the river murmurs among moss green stones. Ultimately, it may be said that lute music in its simplest essence is the echo of these undying voices of living nature. These lines are taken from the preface of Lore of the Chinese Lute, the monumental essay on the classical Chinese lute, the Gu Jin, published in 1940 and written by Robert van Gulik, commonly well known by his Chinese name, Gao Lope, familiar in China till the present day. His lifetime interest and admiration for the Gu Jin was firmly rooted in the years 1943 to 1946, when he served as a diplomat of the Royal Netherlands Embassy in Chongqing, then the wartime capital of free China. It was in this city of towering mountains and rapid streaming waters where he met and married my mother, Xuefang Francis Shui, where I myself was born and where the glory of the Chinese lute had come to him in real life. Before the outbreak of the Pacific War, while serving with the Netherlands diplomatic mission in Tokyo, Japan, he traveled to Beijing in 1936 where he stayed for three weeks and happened to meet the great Qin master Ye Shemun, who initiated him in playing the lute and even perhaps had urged him to acquire, to acquire an ancient lute of the late Ming period. This instrument stayed with him throughout the rest of his entire life. The sojourn in Beijing would prove to be of crucial importance in generating his keen interest in the Gujin. Back in Tokyo, he kept practicing to play the lute and is immersed in researching its history 
and ideological backgrounds. In only a few years' time, the results came to light in his Law of the Chinese Loot, which in the past 80 years still remains the standard scientific work on the subject. This book is respectfully dedicated, so we read, to the memory of my first teacher of the lute, Ye Shimung, a gifted musician and a great gentleman. When his lute master, Ye Shimung, passed away in 1946, a memorial scroll was composed with inscriptions by 18 lute players from all over China, including a superscription by his pupil, Gao Lo Pei, who drew the center picture of the master playing the lute. The face he copied from the photograph, which was attached to the obituary notice. This scroll painting has been preserved and is kept in the National Museum for World Cultures in Leiden. It was particularly fortunate for Gao Pei that during the years in Chongqing, he became acquainted with a vast number of well-known scholars, artists, painters, calligraphers, and lute players who had found refuge in Chongqing as a result of the, war, of the war circumstances. Before long, he was wholly accepted in those artistic and literary circles, and was completely considered as one of their own, even though he was a foreigner of Western origin. But then, it would only seem natural that he had deserved this exceptional status. As an official withstanding, a bright scholar well-versed in the arts and culture of China, an expert calligrapher and a skilled player of the lute, he fully answered to the accomplishments traditionally ascribed to the gentleman scholar, Wunyun, belonging to the class of Chinese literati. There are photographs where my father is seen attending the recitals of prominent lute masters, generally members of the Tianfeng Qinshi, the Lute Association of the Heavenly Wind, of which he had been appointed as secretary. Here, for example, listening to the play of the 1960-year-old lute master, Shi Shaofu, in the country house garden of landowner Yang Shaowu in the outskirts of Chungqing in 1944. The meetings would usually take place in the open air, where the strings of the lute would resound in perfect harmony with the vibrations of the natural surroundings. On one such occasion, there was this lute master who clearly expresses the communal feelings of respect and admiration for my father's lute performance. When he recalls a gathering in a mansion on a hilltop in Chungqing along the banks of the Jialing River. After convivial and very noisy dinner, he notes, quote, all fell silent when Dr. Gao Lo Pei began to play an old song on his lute that in the Chinese tradition sounds like the water softly flowing down from the lofty mountains, Kaoshan Liu Shui. How could we not be fascinated by this young man from Europe whose physical traits are anything but Chinese when he played this song for us that has endured in the Chinese spirit for 2,000 years, unquote. Flowing Waters, Liu Shui, has remained Gao Lo Pei's most favorite tune, finding joy in playing the music brought forward by his exquisite lute of the late Ming period. How many times have the tones of this classical piece resounded in his library at all the various places where he resided in the world? At all times and everywhere, the subdued tones of his antique lute at play, mostly in the quiet solitude of night, would pause at intervals, leaving open an imaginary sound between the movement of strings. He must have been fully aware of the fact that in this seemingly void lies the spiritual essence of the lute music, the silent space that evokes and responds to the states of mind of both player and listener. So, if one were to ask, what are the most difficult parts in playing the lute? The answer would be, those parts where no sound is heard. Gao Pei once remarked that the significance of lute music is to express it while playing and to understand it while listening. However, we should perhaps question this statement by asking 
whether the real sp spiritual essence of the Gujin is not always expressed by solely expressing its play or sound, but rather reflected by its sheer existence. Because it is there, embedded in the sanctuary of the literati studio, together with the books, paintings, and collectibles in scholars' taste. Or just being there as the single most important companion in the quiet mountain retreats of the scholar recluse, sitting in his hermitage, withdrawn from the confusions of life, listening at ease to the sound of the wind in the pines and the flowing waters. Observe here the center part of a landscape painting by Wang Hui, dated 1714, and kept in the Gugong Museum in Beijing. All is well, as long as there's the lute, poetry, and wine, the three best friends. And was it not the Tang Dynasty poet Li Po who composed a wonderful short poem in praise of drinking with a hermit in the mountains? It reads as follows. One cup, another cup, still one more cup. I feel a bit drunk, and the time has come for you to leave. But tomorrow morning, if you would like, do come again, and don't forget to bring the lute. The last two characters of this poem, Bring the Lute, Bao Jin, were written in seal script on this hanging scroll by the Japanese Confucian scholar Nakaya Toju of the 17th century. He applies the flying white technique, Fei Bai, by using a partly dry brush in powerful and expressive strokes. The character Qin below, below shows the pictographic rendering of the lute in transfers. The character above, Pao, to bring, also includes the meaning of embracing the lute, which in itself is more than enough, no need at all to hear its sound. In the last of his pre-war years in Tokyo, Gao Lopez's collection of books and manuscripts on Chinese music had grown considerably and they were kept in a special room which he called the Lute Chamber of the Middle Harmony, Zhenghe Jinshe. In his collection of seals which he engraved himself, this one to the right is inscribed in seal script with the same name, Lute Chamber of the Middle Harmony, which he copied from a Ming period seal. As a justification for this, he notes in his magnum opus, Chinese pictorial art as viewed by the connoisseur, Rome, 1958, that the copying of good old seals is as essential to the prospective seal carver as the copying of ancient masters is to the calligrapher and painter. And by the way, the left self-carved seal reads, to forget with one smile the 100 sorrows, carved in 1940. It is interesting to note that the same square red seal bearing the name Lute Chamber of the Middle Harmony must have been engraved by Gao Lope himself on the underside of his Ming lute. Further above appears the special name of the lute, Songfeng, Wind in the Pines, inscribed in white seal script. Most likely, this inscription was also engraved on the lute by himself. As an accomplished seal carver, this would not have seemed too difficult a task. Following Chinese custom, he changed his library name several times in accordance with the changes in his life. They figure as his signature in publications, calligraphy scrolls, and paintings by him. While in Chongqing, he called his library the hermitage where one sings to the moon, Yin Yuan which he engraved on a wooden board above the entrance of his studio. The name probably alludes to the song of the lute in the breeze, enticing the moon to outshine itself in poetical enjoyment, Yin Feng Lung Yue. Soon after the end of the Pacific War, my parents went to visit Beijing in 1946 to meet my Chinese grandfather, Shui Chun Shao, the first time for my father. While there, he takes part in various local music associations, 
and visits several times the Taoist monastery called the Hall of the White Clouds by Yun Guan, where he meets and plays the lute with the abbot, An Shilin, an expert Qin master. A few years later, he hears to his dismay that the abbot was buried alive by the monks who had found out that he indulged in, magic, in magical experiments with young maidens. This incident would serve as a plot in one of Robert van Gulik's Judge D. detective novels, The Haunted Monastery, 1959. In March 2011, the China National Three Gorges Museum in Chongqing organized an exhibition of calligraphic works and paintings from Gao Lopez's collection, the opening of which was attended by several members of the Van Gulik family. When in Beijing at that time, my brother Thomas and I visited the White Clouds Monastery, and both of us couldn't help feeling the same haunting atmosphere as described in the Judge D novel. Just before closing time of the monastery, we quickly went to explore the backyard of the monastery, and lo and behold, there, before our very eyes, stood the same massive rock table where in 1946, Anshalin played the lute with Gao Lope at his side. And Thomas took this picture of me in exactly the same setting as at that time, 65 years ago. May 1946, the inevitable and sad time had come to leave Chongqing and all those scholars and artists who had come so very close to the heart of their dear friend, Gao Lope. In particular, the music lovers of the Heavenly Lute Association, Yenfeng Jinxue. They were all there as shown in this group picture taken at the farewell party together with the staff of the Netherlands Embassy. In the front row, my mother, wedged in between the two towering figures of her husband and the Christian general, Feng Yuxiang. Second from right, the Netherlands ambassador, Lovink, and third from right, the famous lute master, Xu Yuanbai. He is one of those who contributed to the farewell album filled with beautiful paintings, moving poems, fluent calligraphy, dedicated in warm and grateful memory of Gao Lopez's companionship. This precious album is kept in the Robert van Gulik collection of Leiden University's Asian Library. And here in the album is the landscape painting Xu Yuan Bai entitled Farewell to Good Friend at the Jialing River, Chongqing. And note the tiny group of lute players on the hilltop in the center. To the present day, the Heavenly Wind Lute Association has endured, as well as Gao Lopez's Law of the Chinese Lute, his study on Qin ideology, that still survives as the standard reference work on the subject. Now that it has become available since 2015 in a Chinese version, it will hopefully attract the interest of young and old in the country where the Gu Jin originated. More than 80 years ago, the author of Law of the Chinese Lute confidently looked forward to a renaissance of lute music in China. He would now have been pleased to hear that also younger generations are finding inspiration in Qin music, exploring ways of combining it with modern instrumental compositions. Equally very satisfying to Gao Lopei would be the notion that his cherished Gu Jin Lute, Pine Winds, found the way back to its country of origin in 2016 and is now incorporated in a collection of ancient lutes in the Three Gorges Museum in Chongqing. And grateful that his whole repository of antiquarian Chinese books, albums, manuscripts, and old musical scores are now kept in the Asian Library Special Collections of Leiden University open for study and research by students and scholars worldwide. Since then, in the public galleries of the Three Gorges Museum, a reconstruction has been made of Gao Lopez's study with his original writing table and desktop art objects. On the wall above, there's the original wood wooden board engraved in green. 
the calligraphy of the last name of his library called the hall where clarity is revered, Zum Minge. In this hanging scroll, we see a lonely scholar, detached from the world, blowing in the wind on top of a lofty mountain, brushed in quick calligraphic strokes. This work is not by Gao Lope, but by Gao Chipe, a scroll painting in the beginning of the 18th century and kept in the collection of the Gugong Museum in Beijing. Standing high up in the sky, the scholar depicted is of course totally unaware of the fact that some 250 years later, the spaceship Voyager will be launched into orbit even much higher than the sky into the stratosphere. Also, he would never have known that it would carry on board a golden LP record of the famous lute music piece, Kaohsiung Liu Shui, Flowing Waters, chosen to represent the artistic level of humans on Earth, its music resounding for millions of years in the universe. So, the song of the wind in the pines will keep blowing, and the rush of mountain waters will keep flowing in eternity. <laughs> Thank you, Willem. We are all very touched by your very personal lecture. Thank you very much. For me, it's, um, I learned a lot of new information from your lecture. Thank you again. Now, let's move to London uh, to meet Cheng Yu. She's an internationally Guqin virtuoso and specialist in Chinese music. She's the director of the London Yulan Qin Society. And Cheng Yu will tell us more about the Van Gulik Qin and his favorite song, Flowing Waters. Hello, everyone. I'm Cheng Yu from London. I'm delighted to be invited by Mary Yan and the organizations in the Netherlands for this very special event to celebrate the life and the great legacy of Robert van Gulik. One of the world's greatest 20th century sinologists on Chinese culture, scholarship, his collection and his love of the Guqin and the spirit of literati. I'd like to say a few words about the instrument Guqin, a simple looking zither with seven strings made of two wooden board and finished with fine lacquer. Traditionally, the strings were made of silk. The instrument was created with Chinese cosmological concepts and the harmony between human and nature in mind. In other words, this instrument speaks to heaven, earth, and links with human civilization and refinement. The curved upper body represents the heaven and the flat back body uh, represents earth. The length of the instrument is three Chinese feet and 6.5 Chinese inches represents 365 days in the year. The 13 node markers represents the 13 months of the lunar year. The Guqin is tuned to a pentatonic scale, and the five nodes are associated with Chinese five elements, Jin Mu Shui Huo Tu, which is metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. 
is Gu Qin also viewed as a human being associated with two legendary creatures, the dragon and the phoenix. As you can see, the top part here is called phoenix forehead, followed by the curve of the neck, shoulder, and here has normally have two curves, is wrist, and at the end is dragon's tail. On the lower surface, we can see here are two sound box. This is called Dragon's Pond, and the small one is called Phoenix Pool, with two goose feet. So I'm honored today. I will play this special guqin, which was once owned on played by Robert von Gulick. <clears throat> this guqin is named Longyin, these two characters, which means dragon's roar. And the instrument was with inscriptions inside of the sound chamber and, and on here. You can see the seal um, covered by uh, Mongolic himself, Chinese character Gao Luo Pei. And this Long Yin character uh, was in cursive calligraphy style. And the inside transcription, uh, the inside inscription saying that the instrument was made in 1936 use ancient wood by Li Shaotang and supervised by Xu Yuanbai. Um, worth mentioning, Xu Yuanbai was one of the founders of Heavenly Wind Guqin Association in Chongqing in 1945. He later became a Mongolic's, um, one of the Mongolic Guqin teacher and he made um, more than 50 chins, very fine chins, and is a great Gucci master, calligrapher, and also painter. So, this instrument has many stories to tell and associated with literati in the West and in China. Ah, this is my short introduction before I play music. Thank you. So now we, because of the, the sake of the good sound, we move to another video. Ching Yu playing the lute, flowing waters. Thank you. 
So thank you, Cheng Yu. This was beautiful. Beautiful performance. Um, before um, we move on to the film screening, we invite you all for a break. Uh, join us, please, after the break for a, an interpretation of the writer's life that at times provides a pretext for the exploration of other subjects. Through the portrait of Van Gulik, Rob Lombard, the filmmaker, addresses themes such as the relationship between facts and fiction, between the East and the West, between diplomacy and writing, and the romantic and the erotic. So the film will start at 2.30, that's straight after the break, and I hope to see you all back at that time. We are delighted to, to join you and to, to join you, um, to have you with us for the final part with uh, Rob Rombaut, who is here uh, next to me. Uh, Robert Rombaut was born in Amsterdam in 1953. Uh, he is an independent film director and we know lecturer, teacher and jury member. He was professor at the Lucas School of Arts in Brussels and co-founder and executive of the Doc Nomads program for many years. He has been leading workshops all over the world and has been directing award-winning documentaries for over 30 years. Welcome, Bob. We very much enjoy watching your film, a great masterpiece, which you worked on for more than 10 years. Um, it's really delighted that you could come and join us today. Um, what we'll do is we'll have a conversation with uh, Bob, and in the meantime, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask them through the chat box. So, um, Rob, <laughs> um, our first question is, how did you discover Van Gulik? Can you tell us a little bit why you chose to make a film on the writer who passed away in the 60s? Yes, well, I, I'm living in Belgium and uh, in Belgium somebody approached me and said, uh, I, have, I read a book about uh, your most famous uh, writer, uh, Robert Van Gulik. The book was named uh, The Man of Three Lives. And I, I, I was really surprised. I didn't know that, uh, that writer. And uh, so I read the book, this, this biography about him in French language, which I don't do so very often. And uh, I was very fascinated by his life and his independence and also the fact that he managed to live in between two totally different cultures. And he was like a fish in the water in a total different time. It was in, in, in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And, uh, and also the fact that he managed to do something which nowadays is very difficult. Uh, nowadays we, we are experts in one, in one field. He, was, he managed to be a diplomat, a writer, a scientific and a musician at the same time. So, so I was fascinated more by his life than by uh, the Judge D books. That wasn't my focus. Uh, and, uh, so I decided to, to make a film about this life. Now, there's, some, there's one thing which is very difficult when you make a film. Uh, nowadays, a writer is not very sexy to make a film about. If he's died, it's, it's even worse. If he writes detective stories, it's nearly kamikaze. So it was very difficult to it's, 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 it's a difficult thing to, to undertake a film like that. So I needed a lot of time to prepare and I got some um, uh, script money so I could go around, do a lot of research, meet a lot of people around the world. So it needed a long time of preparation. But once I got the financement, then the nice thing is that nobody on the world, nobody in the world is doing the same thing as you. 
if you make a film about the melting of the ice caps or about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, then you are always hunted. You know? yeah. And you, you have to stand in the line. And there's a risk that once your film comes out, you know, uh, somebody else has a, has, a, has a better film or early finishes it earlier. My advantage is why I had my hands free and uh, I could make really the film I, I wanted. Right. And could you tell us a little bit more why you chose this format? Because it's not a standard documentary no. film, and it relates also to Vangulik in a way that it in a is way, its yeah. own way. So perhaps could tell us a little maybe, bit more. Maybe a little bit in the way of Vangulik film. Vangulik was very independent. And uh, in a way, for me, he's a, he's a free character. And uh, I'm a little bit like that also. And so I, in film, if you make a what they call a biopic, then it's, it's very close to, let's say, Wikipedia with images. So the film is already made before it's made. And it, it doesn't really have a challenge. You merely feel yourself as an executor than, uh, than, rather than a storyteller. So I decided to focus on a special angle. Um, when you make films, you can never be complete. Your mission is not to be complete. You can be subjective. You can be. You can even be wrong. There is always other media that will complete the, the whole film. So I decided my to do my focus about one sentence, which is what what stays from a writer, or from a, in this case, a diplomat or scientific, what stays forty years later. And I went all around the world meeting people that have something with him, that, that I maybe in a way project themselves on him uh, or, or let him project on, on, on their uh, specific uh, field. So I met writers, diplomats, uh, uh, scientific uh, musicians, and uh, they all had one fascination with me as well. Uh, this man, in fact, this man is, is like a little bit like a ghost over, over those people. So it is very challenging to make a film about somebody who died 40 years ago nowadays. That's how I got to your uh, ex exhibition, in, uh, your presentation in, in Shanghai, Robert von Dirk now, because I think we should not uh, consider him as a, as a kind of a closed archive, archive box, but I think and we will come back to that, that there's many things of him that are very uh, contemporary, very actual. And they can form a gateway. Yeah, exactly. Yes. exactly. Okay. And um, we spoke a lot about the Chinese literati today and the relationship of uh, Wang Yulik, and we see it also throughout the film. How do you see this relationship between Robert Wang Yulik, Judge Dee, and the Chinese literati? Uh, well, he himself, is, he had this double aspect. You, you, you must know that even, even when he lived in a total different time as we, he, his ideal image was, was, the, was the Chinese scholar from, from uh, uh, Tang Dynasty. In fact. Uh, um, so he projected, there is, it's, it's a game of projection. He projected him in, in that figure, also in the Judge Di, uh, um, uh, character in a way, um, so he, and that's what all the characters in in the film do. Uh, so, yes, I see. I think it's 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 the word is projection. In fact, that's an answer to your question. Okay, great. There was also a key question that you also wanted to elaborate on is that uh, we had these two great days. We're having exhibitions about yep. Van Gulik. Uh, there is uh, a lot of activities going on also in the past year around Van Gulik. Why do you think it's so important for us to study Van Gulik and the Chinese literati today? Um, well, you know, we live in difficult times now, pandemic times, and uh, well, everything is going very quickly nowadays. And, and uh -huh. all the information we got is always related, it's mostly from journalists. Uh, background. So we focus on a country like China from a perspective of here and now. And, uh, and also we think we know everything because we read so many things. And we sometimes forget that this country is huge. It's a big country 
with uh, regions you never heard about and which you should you should go to in fact and also uh, we we tend to forget that we are this is a country of uh, 3000 years of uh, of even more history and uh, that the actuality where we live in where we focus so much on is only a small detail it, it, it's it's uh, so we should be a little bit more humble i would say if we if we talk about china go there see it by yourself when you go there this, this is what most people go to if you go to china you understand everything the first day then if you come back after the second time, you understand a little bit less, and and things are not what they they, they should be or what they, what you think they are. So, I think this attitude of not knowing or sometimes confusion can be can open yourself and uh, can make you less like a judge or something like that. But be open and and I in that in that extent to answer to your question, I think Pangurik was a was very flexible, was open, open-minded, uh, was curious, was uh, wanted to learn. And uh, I think, in a way, we, we can learn something about that, having the same attitude uh, I I towards China. I would say. Wonderful. You've also spoken to us about uh, the different uh, parts, which is, and Amagens, you mentioned it as well, that it's uh, it's so important to have also wider skill and outlook of life, not being categorized as one. Yes. And, well, and, and having so many interests and so many activities, which then translate into practice, translate yeah. into academia. Can you say something yeah, about, well, about that? Yeah. Well, nowadays, if you say, uh, for instance, if you are, uh, let's say, uh, a writer, you are not supposed to make a, a book, writing a book about uh, biology or. Uh, or uh, if you are a biologist, you are not supposed to write a book about music. But he was a kind of generalist. Uh, he, he, said, he, 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 he was able to write about everything that he was fascinated with. So the word passion okay. is very important. And uh, what I like most about him, that he managed to, to uh, have a passion and then do a scientific work about it. He didn't separate his private life and his professional life. And in that extent, as we yesterday, we had a day of, of I would say, very intellectual approach. Uh, in, in, the, in the film, you see the main character that's coming back is Arthur Japan. And he, he met Van Gulik when he was uh, himself eight years old. And Van Gulik, he he's very dull. When he was 11 years old, he wrote, he, he wrote already a small work on the Wayang uh, puppets in Indonesia. It's nearly an academic work, uh, work. But when he was 50, 55, he spoke to this young boy in a childish way. And I was very much interested in that as well. How can you be on the one hand very intellectual, on the other hand very childish, very, very uh, playful? Uh, uh, how can you be passionate and how can you be uh, uh, intellectual at the same time? So I think that combination and how can you be a biologist, a musician? Uh, so I think this is challenging in, in nowadays time when you only are supposed to be good in one field. So that is what I think is, is important. We should, maybe we can learn something about that. Right. We also um, now give you the opportunity to, um, to, to ask questions. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, I will just check here also for uh, questions. If you have any, you can ask yes. them. There's many questions. Oh, there open. are many questions here. So I'll just see through here. Um, why did, Rob, why did you do the film in Dutch and not in English? In Dutch and not oh, you have it in many languages. Yeah, I yeah. Well, I have a, I have two versions. One when I speak in Dutch myself, I do the voiceover, and one in French, uh, but they are all subtitled in English. Um, well, I think uh, um, I think language is a tricky thing. I mean, Van Gogh he managed to speak uh, several languages. I my life is between French, Dutch, and English. Uh, but you can never be perfect in 
another language. So I, 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 I think I, my, my voiceover was the best in, in French and in Dutch. Wouldn't be in English, so I, I think you can speak in English, but go to very profound feelings. It's, it's a personal film. Uh, and it's also the result of a long period. And uh, so I think your own language is, is the best in a way. Yeah. So you mentioned it a little bit already, but we have a, a question here. Is, uh, it's funny to hear, but I think it's good that you delve into this. So there's a question here asking, are you also a fan of Judge D? Uh, and I think you said something about this, but I think it's interesting to see that you're interested in the other side. So yes, yeah. I'm, I'm, I find it interesting. I, you know, for instance, that there's a small detail, nothing to do with the Judge D, but um, when the diplomats in the United States went on mission in China, they were supposed to read the Judge D story before, because then they at least they get something of the Chinese culture in a playful way, so they don't make too many mistakes. Because in China, there is, there's, you have to get a little bit into the culture to, to move on. You can't, you can't be straight on like like you like the Dutch are or like the Americans are sometimes. Are. So, but uh, myself, I'm I I know the stories. But it's not my input. My input is his independent, his life, his life it's, that reads like a book in a way. And also his, um, I think his life is a little bit a detective story. And uh, sometimes I had the feeling that he um, wanted, but of course it's in my head, but he wanted me to find some details so I can go on from one to another, like a case. And, uh, uh, you know, his, his, um, he, he was, uh, he had a quite a special life and uh, he met a lot of women. So in his agendas, he never wrote everything totally. He used abbreviations. I met the AM today and then I met ZD the next day. And then I, and sometimes it's our women, sometimes it's our diplomats or writers. And so it makes it a little bit, uh, if you if you do some research and make it, there's a little bit suspense in a way. Uh, I would say. And what's also interesting is that you see that many characters also throughout your films have never traveled to China, but through learning from Van Eulich know how to stand in a buffet, or like yeah. Frédéric Le Normand, who knows more about China than the Chinese, but who's never traveled there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my my one of the person I met was uh, Will Dema, and uh, he was the dean of. Uh, uh, Asian studies in Harvard, and uh, so he's a very nice person. He's in the film, by the way. And uh, so I asked him, "What about yourself? Uh, have you been in China?" And he said, "No, not been in China." So you want to go to China? No. He said, China is in my head. I want. I prefer to keep it like that. Yeah. And uh, and it's a bit like that. It's a bit like Frederick Normand and. Maybe that's also a little bit what's happening when you go to China. You, you have a China in your head, but you go there, it's, it is a shock. It's, it's totally different. We have sometimes the idea we go to China, we go back in time. But once you go there, you can see how the world of tomorrow is in some, some way. You, you, so it is a shock, of course. And I can imagine that people prefer to, to keep it inside. But it's funny as you, and that's what we see throughout the film is as long as you, the, lo the more you deep into Van Julik's world and the deeper you get into these characters, you find that behind the skyscrapers of Chongqing, which we yeah. witnessed, yeah. you find Professor e Huang. Exactly. So yeah. somehow it is there. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult when you talk with people, uh, they ask you, where is the real China? And then I say, well, it can, it's in Beijing. Yeah, but it's all high buildings. Yeah, but you go behind that. Yeah, and there you, you meet people and then you suddenly, if you can just not see the surroundings and the modernism, then you can make a, make a jump in a way. And then also you can make French, I, I would say that. Uh, uh, Professor Wang, I don't, he doesn't speak English, I don't speak Chinese, we had an interpreter. But I think on the long term, we understand each other. And if we see each other, we meet each other, we have directly this connection. So, um, yeah, it's, it's you, you have to 
when you go somewhere, you have to first change a, a little uh, setting for yourself and, and open you up. That brings to us to another very interesting question is, how did this uh, making of the movie uh, change your own way of seeing or, or, or your own life? Well, you, you, of course, you, you, uh, it has an influence because some things are, we don't have them anymore. For instance, we, there's, there's uh, elements of courtesy, elements of uh, uh, time, for instance, uh, uh, elements of delicacy. Delicacy, delicacy, delicacy yeah. Yeah. Uh, which when you come back uh, from the trip from China, then you suddenly yeah, look your own world a little bit different. So th th in that way, it might might influence myself uh, in a way. Super. I think we had one more question from Ben May, who was in Rotterdam. Um, if, Rotterdam, uh, if Robert McGillick was still alive and you could ask him one question, what would that be? <laughs> ah, that's difficult. Yeah. That's, a, that's a difficult question. Uh, I would say, uh, I, would, I would still consider him as a master. And I would say, can you please watch this film and give me a detailed critic? on uh, what, not what you don't like, I'm not interested in it, but what's not good. <laughs> it's very difficult to be working on these people's lives and then we can't ask them what, what do you think about it. Yeah, sometimes it's an advantage. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we are going to have one more question yeah. that's coming on the chat, so I have to see it. Um, I, it's, it's, from Marilyn Wong, and it, I was trying to, yes. Um, so uh, there's a question about Van Julie's presence pervades the film, but his time his wife was a bit of a mystery. My question is whether you felt that in the make, in the film that the mysterious aspects of Robert Van Julie's life spurred you on. Uh, it's, a, it's a long question. Yeah, so I'll just go speak a little bit about the the Chinese wife as a mystery, and whether you felt that in the film. Um, he he was quite independent. The, 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 it's too short to, to, to talk about it, but uh, um, it, it's also a story of men and women in a way. But there are periods when he was very feeling very good, you know, like when he was in Japan, when his wife didn't feel very very good. So uh, I think there were some some differences, and also. Um, well, he has a very playful life. He likes his independence. And um, in a way, um, it's, it's, a, it's a small detail I found out that when I read, for instance, the Dutch biography of him, and, uh, and then I compare it with the French biography, the French biography is much more free. Uh, it's much more, you feel much more what, what really happened in his life. I think the, the, the Dutch, Biography by respect of his wife was a little bit clean and uh, yeah. was never so uh, straight on. Yeah. Uh, so he, he uh, and 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 um, I heard from one of the, the the persons, one of the diplomats who died in the meantime, but uh, that he was also. Uh, uh, a wild guy, you know, yeah. and, yeah, and we, a, we know a thing, that. Yeah, a <laughs> thing we don't hear so yeah. much. But 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 uh, he told me some anecdotes, which you could easily put in a film. By the way, uh, that he wasn't only sitting behind his desk; that he he was a player of billiard. He was he was going out. He was a smoker. He was he was this mundane uh, uh, type. Hemingway type, in a way. He was in the tea houses, he was yeah. on the street, he was bored in all these diplomatic yeah. cocktails. He wanted to be with the people at the antique yeah. stores, at the library. So yeah. just one more thing about the wife is that, um, about his wife is that his, her life was equally as interesting as Van Gulick's life. So I think maybe that deserves a separate film. That's something I think so, the yeah. I, well, I, I would say her life in the, in the Holland. She went to yeah, Holland. and, and in Spain. So Spain, that would yeah. be another subject of another film. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's something that would be very uh, interesting to do. I think we're running out of time. So, Rosaline, yes. 
Yeah, so I think well, maybe one more question. No, I it's think okay. we're we're okay. I think what the, the last questions we had um, uh, is the um, is, okay. is uh, we can ask you this last question is because we've just watched the film. So what what would you like the viewers to take from the film and to remember about Thank You Lake and Seals? What what would you what's the, what would you like to take well, away from it? I first of all uh, would ask myself the question, how does it come that uh, as an average Dutchman, which were the most, most viewers, uh, or which most people that we don't hear so much about them. And I think it's a little bit because once you come away from home, you, you are out of the picture in a way. So I, I think um, maybe also that, um, and it's also for the film, that if you are out of the picture, continue with that. This film is also, it's not a, it's not a, a Hollywood production. It's a, it's a, it's a film that, that has even not been on Dutch television to give, you, uh, to give you some feedback. But it will, it will survive in time. I think Van Gulli managed to go over, to survive in time. We have very famous Dutch writers which were stars when they lived and the year after they died, you don't hear about them at all. So he managed in, in a smooth way to continue and to have people talking about him in China, in America, in France. Uh, and I think that, that is a great thing. Uh, for, that's, that's something uh, uh, great for a writer. And if you want to know something in China about the Kuching, you search and you will find them on the internet and you will uh, you will read something about him. So I think staying, he's, he's staying alive in a way. Uh, even yeah, and his work is being continued by others. That's exactly, what we see exactly. through your film, that's yeah, very exactly. much alive. So that's uh, really nice to see. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, for pleasure. well sharing with us your interpretation of uh, Van Gulik's fascinating you. life. Um, well, dear audience, everything always comes to an end. <laughs> what a journey it has been from looking at how Van Gulik's spirit lives on in academia and in the cultural domain, to, and uh, to immersing ourselves in the universe of the Chinese literati, Chinese cultural practice with its sound of Gucci. And finally, by following Rob Rombouts on his tracks and discovering how Van Gulik inspires contemporary figures around the world. We hope that this afternoon inspired you to continue to explore the rich universe of Van Gulik, Chinese culture and the literary, literary taste. Please keep following us, following us on more Asian art studies. Uh, Mr. Huang, I believe that you okay, wanted yeah. to say something. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And before we close the day, I would like to say a thanks to uh, Mr. Klaus Kauper, who helped us uh, uh, for the translation of the texts related to this uh, exhibition. And uh, thanks, very, very, very great thanks to my team who worked with for the uh, China Culture Center, Mr. Tao Yue for the logistics and administrative, um, uh, Peng Xi Rei, the uh, project manager, as well as the operator uh, today. And, uh, Ming, uh, Yu Ming Hong, the uh, graphic designer for this exhibition, and also some volunteers uh, like uh, Yue Tong and also uh, uh, Lawrence, yeah. and also uh, Wu, Wu, Wu Dongchen. Yes, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And so, so other uh, other people, maybe I don't uh, remember all the names. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, once again, thank you. Um, to our great speakers of yesterday and of today, and also to you, great. You were a great audience with a, a lively chat box uh, yesterday and today again. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. I would like to end with some poetic words um, uh, of uh, paraphrasing Robert Van Gulik's words. Um, Contemplating nature is helpful at these stressful times. And I cannot resist the pleasure of leaving you with paraphrasing Robert van Hulik. And it is, the wind will continue running in pines and the river murmuring. We look forward to meeting you soon again. Stay safe and healthy. 
thank you and share 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 in Tajan. Thank you. Great. Wow. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.